to the audience. Yes. Yeah, and to the audience, we were just talking about that if you don't know about it, if you are struggling like, hey, my wife want, wants me to eat some oatmeal for the health of my heart, a uh, scoop of vanilla ice cream, hard vanilla ice cream on that hot piping oatmeal, that's that works. So it, it's, it's the same theory Brian and I have on, um, I can make about any meal work if I have like some potato chips. You know, just give me some potato chips and we, we can, and not only that, but maybe some cheese and olives and pickles. And you might say like, well, wait a minute now, Mark, you're kind of veering away from what the meal was. But yeah, if I got my little things there, yeah, I can, uh, I can make any meal work with that. It's starting to sound like stone soup to me. It does. It is that story of stone soup. And, and isn't that an amazing story? There's a great lesson there. I like that. Great American Soup Stone, Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show. We don't know what you're talking about, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Which, is that kind of typical, usually? Is that the, the way it goes? Like, well, we're not sure what you're talking about there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about a woman, that, you know, family that's so poor, the woman just dipped the bone in, a, in the boiling water and made soup out of it and they called it the soup stone wow i think that dr hook it may have been uh, ccr the great american soup stone they called it. well the, the stone soup story was that these two poor guys come into town and they don't have anything to eat so they start boiling a stone and all the people come up and say what are you doing they say well we're making we're making stone soup um, and, and everybody wants to watch because they said, stone soup, you can't have that. He says, sure, but stone soup is perfect with just a few carrots. So somebody says, well, well, I got some carrots and they throw them in. And he says, well, this stone soup's good. We need a little more salt. And they said, I got salt. And well, we need some potatoes. Oh, I got potatoes. Well, we need some beef. I got beef. And of course, the story is that in the end, they end up with stew, uh, starting with stone soup. Yeah. Well, hello, America. You have turned into Answering Religious Error live, Baba Q&A. And it's good to be with you on this glorious Wednesday morning. Uh, many of you are East Coast time. I, I'm out here on the West Coast about ready to fall off. I'm um, just a couple blocks from the Pacific, so I'm right on the edge. And then some of our other panelists are in other parts of the country. So we kind of have the country surrounded here and uh, we're gonna be answering your Bible questions. And um, we're appreciative for you turning in and spending uh, an hour of your time having the scriptures open, being like the Bereans, searching the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. That is having no agenda, but just a, a love of the truth. And I appreciate Colton's in the background helping with the show today and all our men that are on here courageously like, hey, give me your Bible question and I'll open up the scriptures and try to share my knowledge with you of, of God's word. There are some other things that are going on as well. I know every morning because I'm part of it, Monday through Friday, um, it drops 5 a.m. Eastern time. It's the daily answer. It's it's like a 15-minute podcast. And so feel free to pop into that. It's on platforms like Spotify. And then Tuesday, and we've kind of changed the time there. It's Tuesday, and it's Why I Believe, and it's at noon Eastern time. And we're going, we've been just kind of looking at like, well, why I believe in this and why I believe in that, God and scriptures and Jesus and the last episode was well. Why do I believe in what the Bible says about hell? And we did we discussed that great conversation, and also older women likewise. That's Thursday and that's in the evening. That's at eight p.m. Eastern time, and that's older women teaching younger women, and that's 
that, that's kind of what's going on. And we appreciate everyone who seeks to make um, the contribute to that, including our audience, including the people that are tuning in. And behind me, that's Bella. That's Bella the cat. And here are here's the panel. Here's the panel we have. And gentlemen, how is it going on this glorious morning? It's wonderful here in Alabama. <laughs> and you know what's interesting as we look at the panel, Bob. We, I've uh, had dinner with you there in in Macon and Terry. I've uh, we've had dinner together down in Russellville or uh, what Spruce Pine or there's a number of different names for that region. And um, Brian Haynes, we've had multiple dinners um, up in and we were camping for a week this year. And then Nick, Nick, I haven't yet visited Nick. And I know, Nick, you're, what, maybe about an hour from Chris Kramer? Yeah, that's about right. Uh, he lives down in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and I'm just on the northwest side of Bowling Green, Kentucky. So uh, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump uh, to where Chris is, uh, in contrast to how far apart places are in the west coast there. But you know all about that. Yes, hopefully, you know, this, uh, this coming... Um, spring as we venture out of florida try to hit the eclipse in texas but then among other things we're headed for the upper p up to michigan and wisconsin and that and hopefully we'll be able to come through more of because there's a number of christians in kentucky ohio indiana um that we just haven't seen yet and there's a number of great churches there before we get started though let's start with a word of prayer brian haynes uh, would you uh, lead us in that prayer? Yeah, would you join me? Most holy God and Father in heaven, we're so very grateful that you have blessed us in so many different ways. One of those ways, Father, with your word that we might uh, peruse it and understand it and come to know you better and the blessings that you offer to us, Father. We're grateful for this time we have to come together and to consider uh, you, the things that uh, many people have questions about, Father, uh, fulfilling our obligations to be ready with answers. Uh, for the things that people desire to know. Father, we're grateful for the medium that is given us this opportunity, and we're grateful for those who are listening in, who are participating with us in this study, and we're uh, asked, Father, that the blessings of your word might fall upon us all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And I know, Colton, uh, that uh, if people want to send in a question, there is a there's a place that they send it to, and uh, we'll throw that up on the screen. There you go. Uh, I'm not the regular host. I'm the guy. I'm the guy that's sitting on the bench. I've been sitting on the bench, and I get back there. I've been swinging and et cetera, whatever. But I haven't been in the game as the host, and uh, and so now, like the first baseman got hurt, and they here the, here I come, here I come, and I'm in the game, and so that's what's going on today. Um, but meantime, right? And so that's what we're going to deal with first. Well, here is today's meme. Church of Christ, one cup communion congregation speak what the scriptures speak. Multiple cup congregations speak the devil's words. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, when I look at a meme like this, it's almost like, well, why don't you tell me what you really mean? You know, stop beating around the bush or whatever. But gentlemen, what do you have on this particular meme? Well, I would say uh, there's a lot of reading into the text and misapplication when one comes to the conclusion that Jesus was talking about a container. And that's what they think they, they see in this text about uh, serving the Lord's Supper. They think that Jesus says, take this container and drink from this container, all of you. And that's not what the, the scriptures is talking about. He's talking about the the content, the, the fruit of the vine, drink from this fruit of the vine. This is the cup that Jesus is talking about. And it's just turn over to a couple of passages and we can demonstrate who is actually speaking the Lord's words and doing it and who is not. Look in Matthew 20, 26 at the text where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and starting with about verse 27, says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood 
of the new covenant. Now, let's ask this question immediately then. This refers to the cup. Uh, is it the container that is his blood? Or is it the fruit of the vine that is his blood uh, shed for many for remission of sins? It's the fruit of the vine. That's the cup that Jesus is talking about, not the container. And to prove that even more in verse 29, he says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. This fruit of the vine is what he drank from and instructed them to drink from. So if we're drinking from the fruit of the vine, we're doing what Jesus said. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for one to insist that Jesus is taking the container and saying, drink from this container. Uh, when in the next verse, he says, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. He's talking about the content, not the container. And then he says, uh, well, let's turn over to the next account that I'd like to call your attention to is uh, Luke 22. And notice the words of Jesus expand, expand a little bit in Luke's account. Uh, he took, this is Luke twenty two seventeen. 17. It says, he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this, take this cup and divide it among yourselves. As he instructed them to divide a container. And if the answer is yes, then I would say that these churches of Christ who use one container but they don't divide that container up. They're not doing what Jesus said do. They're, uh, they're actually ignoring what Jesus said do. But Jesus says, take it, take this and divide it among yourselves. Well, how do you do that? Well, you divide the content. You're not, talking, you're not dividing the container. You're dividing the content. So if they divided the content among themselves, that means that there were at least 12 containers they divided it into to, for those 12 disciples to take that cup and divide it among themselves. So again, those that use one container, if that's all you got, that's fine. But if you're binding and you're saying that Jesus says, take this cup and you're not taking that cup that Jesus was holding, you're taking something else. And then if you divide and if you don't divide that container, then you're disobeying Jesus. If that's what Jesus was talking about, of course, Jesus wasn't, wasn't talking about the container. He's talking about the fruit of the vine. You divide this among yourselves and they did so. And when we divide it among the brethren, whether it be uh, by sipping from one container, or if we d divide it among ourselves by pouring it into our own individual containers, those things that we are doing is taking the fruit of the vine. And if that, if you just happen to have only one container, the Jesus is not going to be upset about that. But if you bind that it has to be one container, then it's got to be the container Jesus was holding. It has to be the one he was holding right then. And you have to take that and divide it among all the different congregations. And of course, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not what the, the, uh, the Bible talks about. And one other passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to notice verse 25. He says, in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Well, he's saying drink this cup. If he is saying drink the container, then you don't do that either. You're drinking content from a container but you're not drinking the container. You're not drinking this cup. So again, those that are insisting on one container are really divisive and they are uh, misrepresenting what Jesus was talking about. And therefore they are the ones that are speaking the devil's words. Those are my thoughts. 
Gentlemen, do you have any other observations on this particular question? Boy, Terry hit it good. Uh, Terry, you didn't leave much for the rest of us because uh, you covered it so well. I like to hit a lot of the points Terry made. The only other one I sometimes bring up is which is more representative of blood? Jesus said, this is my blood, uh, a container or a liquid. Um, that's just simply one small point I, I add to uh, all the things that Terry has had to say because uh, Terry covered it very well. You know, there's one other passage maybe I would throw in, gentlemen, would be over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul, not in Corinth, but writing to the Corinthians from Ephesus, talks about that the cup that we, the cup that we partake of. And yet it's clear that Paul's not in the same group. It's not the same congregation, and it's the, not the same container, but the singular cup and spoken of as a cup they share uh, that sort of language is used where it's obviously more than one cup is under consideration. Uh, I know I think there's a great lesson here for us is it just seems like groups that fall into this air that we're dealing with here, the one cup, get so focused on that that they com completely miss other Bible doctrines in the process that it's one of those things that th they're so keyed in on that that a lot of other stuff comes through the door that they're completely not aware of. Nick, you got a comment. Yeah, and it actually kind of gets more onto the humorous side of things because uh, I was studying with my kids and we were talking about figures of speech. And, and in this study, we came across this word that was spelled S-Y-N-O. Uh, S-Y-N-D-O-C-H-E. And we had no idea what this word was. And so we went on to YouTube to try to figure out what the word, how to say it. Um, and the first video that we pop up is this hilarious video that does the like pronunciation frame and everything, but it's like, send it into Dochi. We all laughed knowing that was not it, but it was hilarious. It's pronounced syndicate. And it is a figure of speech where a an object takes on the meaning of something else and we use the that word to refer to the other object uh, for example if i say i want to go out and get my wheels we know we're talking about my car and so it's a figure of speech to refer to something else and so to say the cup it becomes a representative of the contents and so it is a commonly used uh, form of figurative language. And, and so sometimes we can get confused when we do not appreciate figurative language. And then we begin to uh, make the application on, on the wrong emphasis there. And so uh, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, I thought it was kind of a funny story how my kids and I came across this new word and, and then trying to figure out how to pronounce it. Uh, and that video was just, I mean, we, my kids still uh, on the road when we're just driving around, they just pop up Sinadina Dochi. <laughs> they get a kick out of it. It's, it's pretty fun. Bob, you got a comment? Yes. It seems to me strange that, you know, they make this big deal out of the cup and they say, like, where is the authority for multiple containers? And I would ask, well, where is the authority for multiple plates on which the bread is placed? Uh, one cup, one bread. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Does that mean just one loaf of bread that has to be shared with all the congregations in the world? Or that one loaf of bread uh, uh, to be shared with uh, Dwayne Paul and the Corinthian uh, brethren? Uh, it's simply calling attention to the substance of, of bread and not just the fact that it is a single loaf. And again, where is the authority for the plates? If there has to be specific authority for the cups, plural, where is the authority for the, the plates? And in Acts chapter 2, we have over 3,000 people continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. Well, did all 3,000 drink out of the same cup? Did they have a cup large enough to be filled up and, and divided among uh, uh, 3,000 people? Or would they not have required uh, a, a number of jugs, uh, such as we see in the wedding feast of John chapter uh, John chapter 2. Uh, and so it, it just t seems to me that they, they're they just trying to pick out this one thing and uh, and they forget about the obvious consequences of not having authority on their, on their reasoning, not having authority for a single plate. 
Bob, thanks for your comments. And gentlemen, uh, that is our meme. Now we do have, uh, Colton, I think we had a couple of follow-up questions that we were, that as we were discussing this kind of came in and here would be one. In Jesus's day, grape juice was a part of the Passover, but it does not seem to be included when originally instituted. So were the Jews in Jesus's day adding what was unauthorized. Uh, Brian Haynes, did you have a thought on that? That's a really tough question, actually. Um, so when you talk to somebody today who's Jewish and they talk about the Passover, they'll usually talk about four cups um, that are brought to the Passover table. But the but the history of that is kind of muddied. It's not it's not exactly clear when that began. And and the evidence that they were doing that practice in the time of Christ isn't clear. Um, Paul does use the term the cup of blessing when he's talking in 1 Corinthians 10. We brought that passage up already. And that is a term that's used for one of the four cups. And so it's possible they were using those four cups, but it's not exactly clear. Uh, so, David, the best answer I have, it's a really good question and uh, one I don't have a great answer for. But the best answer I have is that we would we would assume by inference that they have to drink something with this meal. In other words, uh, um, like any meal, you know, you need something to wash it down, so to speak. It couldn't be fermented drink. We know that the elephantine uh, papyrus in the fifth century BC talks about using uh, unfermented fruit of the vine with the Passover, that it couldn't be a fermented drink, they said. So that idea, of, uh, because it had leaven, um, so they wouldn't bring that into it. So we we know that there was a practice of having some kind of fruit of the vine, um, but it's more the idea of just something to drink as opposed to a part of the ceremony. So, so David, my best answer, I'm actually hoping other guys have a better answer than mine. My best answer is, is that while uh, this does over time become part of the Passover, I'm not sure necessarily it was part of the Passover at that time as much as it was just something that was brought in uh, in part because it's necessary to have something to drink and uh, it fit the requirements of not being a fermented drink. Um, we know water was was kind of a dangerous thing at those times too, so they had to be careful with that as well. And so it's very likely that was just the common drink for the Passover meal, not necessarily that that was a required drink or part of the ceremony itself. And as I said, it does become part of the ceremony later, but it doesn't look like it's not clear from historical texts if it was part of the part of the ceremony in the first second. I, I think it's not till the fourth or fifth century that we're reading about it. Um, uh, David, let's see if the other guys have a better answer. You know, it's interesting on that. Brian, sim uh, uh, Jesus simply takes it. It's there and says, OK, I'm going to incorporate this into this new memorial. Um, gentlemen, any other thoughts on that particular question? You know, G Jesus very presence and participation in that Passover meal gave it gave his authority to that wine. Uh, and by wine, I don't mean fermented juice, but the word wine in both Hebrew and Greek refers to the juice of the grape, whether fermented or unfermented. And, uh, and and it's never called wine, by the way, in connection with the Lord's Supper. It's always the fruit of the vine. And so he gave his uh, his approval of it. And so who are we to say that they couldn't do it? Jesus did not take issue with it. And as Brian just said, he incorporated that cup, that fruit of the vine, the contents, as uh, Terry pointed out, into the Lord's Supper. But he gave it a new meaning by showing that because of its color and liquidity, it was a fit symbol, a fitting symbol for his blood that was indeed about to be poured out for many for the remission of sins, just as the bread was a, a fitting symbol of his, uh, his flesh, which was untainted uh, by sin. And so uh, it was authorized, whether we can pinpoint exactly where in the Old Testament it was, Jesus knew it was authorized or he would not have participated in it. Bob, interesting observation. I think that's a good observation that here is someone who never sinned and certainly would have. And typically when the Jews were doing unauthorized things, he called them on that and pointed that out. And so if he's participated in it, I, I think you make a pretty good case. Then he is saying that this is an, an authorized practice or clearly not a sinful practice. Gentlemen, any other thoughts on that particular question? If not, Colton, I thought there was another one that kind of, yeah, 
Is it okay for Christians to perform hymns, spiritual songs before a group of people, whether Christians or not? And and I guess I guess first of all, it would be like perform. <laughs> what what? Because sometimes when we hear the word perform, it means like you're putting on an act or a show or something like that. But I know this that yeah, that it is certainly authorized. You are allowed to sing spiritual songs before unbelievers. Um, Paul and Silas are in the Philippian jail, and they are singing hymns at midnight, and the other prisoners who are not believers are listening. But gentlemen, you have any other thoughts on this particular question? Well, that's the one that, that came to mind was Paul and Silas singing in front of unbelievers. So, yeah, a um, little question that I have on the question itself is on the word perform are they just doing a performance or are they singing from the heart and i think we should always sing spiritual things from our hearts in front of anybody and everybody those are my thoughts you know it seems like that the word perform here might be a problematic translation of of the individual this apparently is not a person uh who would speak uh, uh english by uh by birth he would have learned english perhaps as an adult he's trying to make his own translation I, I do a lot of teaching with indians uh people in india not people in the american west but uh and and they use words in a way that that we generally don't use them and so perform i would give him the benefit of the doubt that he just means to to sing them uh certainly Preaching and singing are not intended to be performance arts in the in the fashion of entertainment. If that is what he means, then no, we should not be using hymns and spiritual songs as entertainment at all, even, even amongst ourselves, much less before others. But I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he just means to, uh, to sing these songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. And yeah, nothing wrong with doing that in the presence of unbelievers. I think at times, Bob, there are a number of, uh, you know, I know I know there are Christians at times that go into and do Bible studies, like let's say at a nursing home or something like that, and they might sing some songs there. Also, uh, I know I've, I've been camping before and the Christians have brought some song books and in the campground, we've, we've sang some songs and man, it's kind of like Paul and Silas. It has attracted the attention <laughs> of some of the, fellow campers because a cappella singing, a cappella singing um, is just one of those things that I think really draws people in, especially when they're listening to the words. Other thoughts, gentlemen? One more thing on a cappella singing. Uh, everybody knows that means without the instrumental accompaniment. Originally in, in Italian, that meant as in the chapel. And so this is the way that singing was originally done in congregations of the Lord's people. And so when somebody, once they started using uh, man-made instruments, every now and then they said, well, let's sing it like they do in church, uh, a cappella. And, uh, and of course, that's, that's all we find in the New Testament uh, where Christians are concerned. We don't find any use of instrumental music in the, uh, in the worship. Yeah, the comment that we were just received, that's a great observation. Sometimes you forget about that is that, and where you guys are at, you have the same thing. You have people from the community come into your services and they're not Christians, they're not believers. And it, what is, isn't that an interesting thing that there you are and you're, you're preaching God's word, you're preaching it clearly, you have a godly life and you are worshiping. And there's something about that that can be incredibly convicting the people who come from the community that are trying to come out of sin and and darkness. All right, gentlemen, are we ready then to go on to our next question? All right, Woo. okay, here's one. Get your toothpicks out. A uh, little bit of roast beef for this one. What is the difference between sins of omission and commission? What's the difference between sins of ignorance and defiance? What are secret sins? What are presumptuous sins? Hey, could we break that? It, would it be good just to kind of break it up and say, okay, first one, sins of omission and commission. Anyone want to uh, jump in on that one? Well, I would start with James chapter 4, verse 17. If a man knows to do good 
and doesn't do it, then what he's what he's done is he's omitted doing the good he knows to do. So that would be a sin of omission. If I know that uh, I need to uh, help a neighbor that's uh, fallen on hard times and I don't I don't take advantage of that opportunity. That could be a sin of omission just by doing nothing. Uh, when you're supposed to do something <clears throat> on the, on the uh, sin of commission. Uh, that's when God has forbidden you to do something, uh, flee fornication, but then we don't flee fornication. Uh, that's a sin of commission. We've committed a, a directly, uh, directly defiant um, of what God commanded us not to do. So those are the two things about omission and commission is you can do you cannot do what you should when you know you should and you can fail to do what you shouldn't and uh and those are those are commission and omission sins i'd let somebody else take the second part about ignorance and defiance you know before we move on terry great mm -hmm. observation because i think we focus so much on this the thing that you do that's wrong or forbidden and you forget it. And sometimes people say, well, I didn't do anything. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> the problem is you didn't do anything is that we forget about this category. And it, it's interesting. I think man tries to put, has these categories and I appreciate that. So things don't blindside us, but that James 417 is a great example of the person who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. It said, I think also James two, the brother or sister in need, and you don't help them out that would fall into the same category or Matthew 25. I was sick. I was hungry. I was in prison and you didn't help me or come to me. That would fit into the same category as well. What about that other category? The next one, gentlemen. Well, the, the sins of ignorance and the sins of defiance, I think maybe numbers chapter 15 helps us wrap our mind around it quite well, because it does discuss uh, the sins of ignorance or maybe some versions might say the sins that were committed unintentionally. Uh, and, and so we, we see that there are, you know, we commit sins. Sometimes we don't intend to uh, commit them, but then sometimes we are defiant and we purposely say, I'm going to do this anyway. And, and so there is a distinction to be made between those types of sins, uh, especially there in the Old Testament. Uh, if we look at uh, like verse 27 of Numbers 15, it says, also, if one person sins unintentionally, then he shall offer a one year old female goat for the sin offering. The priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who goes astray when he sins unintentionally. You, uh, then you fast forward just a little bit, verse 30. But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be completely cut off. His guilt will be on him. And as an example, I, I look at verses 32 and following when the guy goes out and picks up sticks defiantly on the Sabbath day. He knew very well what not to do, but yet he does it anyway. And then, of course, his punishment is to be uh, killed. And so you see that there is a definite distinction made in the old law regarding the sins of ignorance and the sins of defiance. And and there is some references made to that in the New Testament as well. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 talks about he received mercy and grace because he had done those things in ignorance, uh, you know, such as uh, his war against Christians at the beginning. He, uh, he thought he was doing right, but he was actually ignorant of that and he had to learn. Uh, and then, of course, when we start wrapping our minds around even the Day of Atonement, uh, the commentary out of Hebrews chapter 9 indicates that the sins that were forgiven uh, in, uh, in the day, on the Day of, of Atonement uh, were the unintentional sins. Um, and so the defiant sins, the only course that the law offered was the idea of death. <laughs> that person was to die. And that begs the question, then what about David? Because he committed some defiant sins, murdering Uriah, committing adultery with Bathsheba. There was nothing in the law that allowed him to offer to be re, to receive forgiveness or atonement. But yet he does, which is interesting. And so in Psalm 51, we see that he has to lean 100 percent entirely on the mercy of God, which is grace. And. 
And so that becomes the uh, the hope of the Christian today that we can see the um, uh, the power in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is much more powerful than any sacrifice out of the Old Testament because it can cover all sins because we can receive the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. And and it, but it goes to the, the the last question there where we were talking about the uh, omission of commission. Uh, we get it in our heads that, oh, here's a checklist of things that I'm not supposed to do. But the sins of omission moves us to realize, hey, not only am I supposed to just avoid some things, but I need to be moved to become a different person and act as Christ would act. And, and of course, that helps us wrap our minds around the sins of omission and commission as we grow out of our ignorance and we stop being defiant and start living as Christ lived. Nick, good observations. Appreciate numbers 15 being brought into the conversation. I think it's interesting, gentlemen, that even when it comes to the sins of ignorance, it's they don't remain ignorant. Is that that text necessarily infers that it comes to light? It's not like, well, I'm ignorant and never knew about it because then, well, how do I fix it? How do I offer sacrifice for it? I'm not sure, too, on some of the sins of defiance, is that where a person remains defiant? You know, maybe because I know David, when he's immediately confronted, repents. But God's mercy, you're right, is incredible. Um, the thought on secret sins, gentlemen, I guess it would be like, well, wait a minute, they're not secret to God, <laughs> so they're really not secret. But I think of Second Tim, uh, excuse me, First Timothy chapter five, which talks about some some men's sins are pretty much obvious; others go before them to judgment. But my thought, I don't know about you gentlemen, my thought is that typically no sin ever remains secret forever. That usually it always comes to the surface some way. I think of Numbers 32, be sure your sins will find you out. But how about that one on presumptuous sins? That's an interesting one. Any thoughts on that last one, presumptuous sins? Yeah, I would think of uh, Leviticus uh, 10, 1 and 2, where Nadab and Abihu uh, took strange fire, fire that is, uh, from a source God didn't speak to. He spoke to where to get it. But they presumed, it seems to me, they presumed that fire is fire. It doesn't matter where we get it. When God has already spoken about what he wanted was the fire from off the altar. And um, so they that seems to me to be a presumptuous sin on their part. You're presuming that God accepts what you presume he should accept. Uh, and he doesn't do that. God doesn't operate that way. Uh, you can see so many presumptions in the traditions of men being brought in. They presumed that this would be a good, good command. Uh, and Jesus didn't acknowledge it. Matthew chapter 15, they presumed that he should have uh, followed their traditions of men. He says, no, your traditions have taken priority over the law of God. And we don't follow uh, the traditions of men. It makes worship to God in vain. When you you elevate human opinion and human desire, and you presume that God accepts that, uh, when you have no you have no reason from God to assume that you can uh, you can practice that and bind that on other people. So uh, I think presumptuous sins is just thinking that you know as much about the mind of God. Uh, that uh, that you can presume he accepts this. I just assume it. I don't have to. I don't have to question it. I just assume it. And if you do that, that's presumptuous on your part. Good thoughts, Kerry. Bob. I know you have a comment. It was interesting. It's one of those things. Like I said, okay, let me look up the word presumptuous again to make sure. You know, sometimes you use a word but you forget. Like. Okay, what's the word really mean? And it's interesting. Part of the idea of presumption is that you cross a boundary, that you're you're you're, you're crossing like a line somewhere. Bob, you got a comment? Yeah, just a couple of uh, verses from the Old Testament regarding secret sins. Uh, David said in Psalm nineteen twelve, "Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults." Is 
provided by the translators there are some translations say sins also in ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14 for god will bring every good work or every work into judgment including every secret thing whether good or evil and as, as has been pointed out nothing is secret from god and so these are things that you've committed or omitted of which no one else is aware and and you have not brought this to their attention they don't know to bring uh, to come to you and explain to you your need to repentance because they don't know of your sin. God does. And of course, our knowledge of it either will bring us to the point of repentance or will or will not. Sometimes we are hardened by our sins and the refusal to recognize them as sins. And sometimes we are softened by the fact that we realize they are sins and we can't get that fact out of our minds. We can't justified and we are brought to repentance by our by our conscience and so and also in psalm verse 9 chapter 90 and verse 8 david says you have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your countenance and so god will hold us accountable for it but it's up to us to come to ourselves and admit these uh things uh these sins to god and if it is uh, something against a brother, then you need to repent uh, toward the brethren and ask them for their forgiveness as well. You know, it's interesting. Uh, D- David also speaks in Psalm 19 of uh, verse 13. He talks about, uh, you know, keep thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. And, and I think Terry, I think carries along the right track. I think presumptuous sins is where you're just taking something for granted. You're moving into unauthorized territory, knowing Nadab and Abihu. But I think of, you know, putting the ark on a new cart. I think of Saul, King Saul, and as he um, kind of ad-libbed on the command that God gave him. And it's, it's one of those dangerous things, I think, that people say like, well, I don't see anything wrong with this. And so I'm sure God wouldn't see anything wrong with it. Instead of going to the text and saying, wait a minute, what does the text say? And I thought it's interesting. David said, let them not rule over me. That is, it's so easy to get into a mindset that says, wait a minute, I don't see anything wrong with that. And, And to forget like, okay, but you're not God and you're not the judge and you're fallible. And, um, actually what the scripture teach. Gentlemen, any other any other comments on this particular question? All right, Colton, we got a question that we need to. Yeah, here we go. What are the main arguments for and against having kitchens and fellowship halls? Um, Brian Haynes. Yeah, uh, it was kind of a uh, neat that uh, we were just talking about the consideration of presumptuous sins. Um, because perhaps this is a conversation that falls into that category of things that we are uh, stepping into an area of not being authorized. Um, one of my favorite passages for that, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul makes a statement that uh, he wants us to learn not to think beyond what is written. So the thing that we oftentimes present with this conversation is that uh, the idea of having kitchens and fellowships halls are an innovation to the work of the church, meaning we don't see in the New Testament Uh, a place where the church is charged with the work or with the purpose of socializing itself and coming together to eat common meals and the like. Indeed, um, the very fact that people call eating fellowship is a real problem because 1 John chapter 1 defines fellowship as walking in the light, not as eating together. Um, uh, you know, the, to, to misuse the word fellowship and turn it into a word that just means eating certainly has to make God cringe at the least, if not uh, outright uh, anger God by misusing his words. It is, a, it is a definite misuse of the word fellowship to just lower it to just eating uh, or the like. Uh, but the truth of the matter is there's simply no authority for it in the scriptures for the church to do this work. Now, let's be clear, there's there's very much an authority for members of the church, for us as individuals to do this, and it's called the work of hospitality. And indeed, it's something that we will be judged for, our hospitality to one another, whether it's Hebrews 13 and the command there for us to show hospitality to one another and to strangers, um, whether it's the command for an elder to be somebody who has demonstrated hospitality. We are personally to be hospitable to one another. 
Um, ironically, churches that tend to have kitchens and fellowship halls tend to take that work away from members and give it to the church. Um, and by surrendering that work, we're surrendering something that we're under, we're accountable for and that we're meant to be judged for. And so those social purposes uh, that are given to us as members are being taken away from us whenever they're taken into the church and made for the church. You know, we can see in a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, when he was talking about the Corinthians coming together for worship, uh, and he says, you come together as a church, you come together in one place. And he says, it's not about eating. You know, it's, he says, it's, you have homes to eat in. It's not, it's not about satisfying this, you know, the, the fleshly desire of, of just food. He says, this is something spiritual and something holy that we come together with a purpose to do. And again, the problem with kitchens and fellowship halls, and they tend to be tied side by side in the problems there, is that, uh, is that they are also carnalizing spiritual things. I was just studying with somebody on this this past week, and he was describing to me, having been to a church recently that had a kitchen and a fellowship hall, he said about halfway through worship service, uh, people started getting up and going down to that place and making sure their food was being cooked right and getting things ready. They were actually leaving the assembly of worship in order for these carnal things. And I said, well, it's a good indication of where people's uh, mind lies. It doesn't lie with uh, obedience to God. It lies with these social things. And too often that's what happens, that these social appetites overtake our spiritual uh, pursuits and uh, weigh us down. So there's just one thought to throw at us. Uh, of course, the issue of authority. I'd like to hear what the other guys have to say as well. Brian, great comment. You know, I'm glad you brought up 1 Corinthians 11 and we'll get Bob's comment here is that it's interesting that Paul said, if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. He does not give like a, obviously there were buildings and obviously they could meet in the building, but it's interesting that when, if a, if a church was misusing thing, something that was lawful, the thing that they misused was never taken off the table, like spiritual gifts. You can still do spiritual gifts. They were misusing them, but here's the way you do it. But it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul does not say, hey, have your worship service, then have a prayer, and then go go down to the kitchen and eat, etc. That no alternative like that is given. The Bible makes a very clear distinction distinction between Christians coming together for worship and then what they did in their own homes. First Corinthians 11, uh, 11 is one and Acts 246 is a second one. Bob, your comment. I just want to expand a little bit on what uh, you and Brian said without taking anything away from, uh, from your words. I think the big problem is many people think that the, the local church is to be a social institution. Christians are certainly to be sociable and social. Worship itself is, uh, to some extent, social. When we come together in one place to worship God, to have fellowship with one another, and to have fellowship with God in the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, praying to God, uh, eating the Lord's Supper, laying back in store, etc. There is uh, there is some social social activity there. I mean, you you can't do it alone, and doing it with anyone else it makes it essentially social to an extent. Uh, when we come into the building, we socialize until time to begin the, uh, the worship. Uh, but that does not make the local church a social uh, institution uh, or a, a social body. And uh, we do have a fellowship hall here at, in Macon at the Forest Hills Church of Christ in our building. And uh, it's the place where we come together and we sit on pews and, uh, and we listen to the Bible being taught or preached. And uh, we sing these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, we engage in the acts of worship. And, and that is how we have fellowship. And as, as Brian pointed out, this idea that eating alone, uh, that eating by itself, not by oneself, but eating in, it, in and of itself is, so, is fellowship. That's just, that's wrong. And uh, it is social activity. It is mere social activity. And the local church is not authorized to come together and to engage in activity that is merely social. Again, you can't come together for spiritual needs without some degree of sociality involved. But that's not our main, our main intent. Our main intent is to worship God, to edify one another. Good comments, Bob. Uh, Terry? Well, Bob took most of what I was going to say, but 
the fellowship hall that we do meet in is is where we assemble together to worship God. That's our fellowship. That's our expression of the commonality that we share in Christ Jesus. We share Christ. We share his body and his blood. We share the spiritual benefits that flow from him. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is in Christ. And that's where our, our, our partnership, our fellowship is. It's not over there in a separate building where you eat. It's here that we're expressing our common uh, fellowship with Christ. Uh, it'd be the, the concept of a separate room for fellowship. That's just really foreign to the New Testament. And I would I would add game rooms. Is that that is it, games? Is that the basis of our fellowship? Have a game room. That's the fellowship hall. What you do in the auditorium where you met together to take the Lord's Supper. Oh, that was that was the real the biblical fellowship. So we're going to another room to play games because that's not in the Bible. But we want to presume that we can do that a fellowship game room, a fellowship eating room. Uh, those concepts are really not uh, what the Bible expresses. Now, yes, because we share commonality in Christ, we, we, sh we can have games in our homes, uh, as was suggested. We can have meals in our homes and invite others or some other place, have a potluck. We can do that, but that's that's on an individual basis. That's not the work of the church. And that kind of the idea of the work of the church includes those things is really not, uh, really not what you can find in the, in the Bible. You can find individuals doing things as individuals and inviting a number of people to share games, but that game is not the fellowship nor the basis of it. It's individuals saying we can, we can do this as um, expression of our home, and we want to share some home life with you there, and so that that's a different matter than the fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. Hey Nick, what you got? Well, I might step on Terry's toes a little bit. I mean, uh, follow his footsteps. I guess would be a better way to phrase that uh, kind of echo some of his things but when i think of this conversation especially how he's asked the question what are some of the main arguments for and against having kitchens and fellowship halls um really it, it comes down to the work of the church what are the three works of the church as a collective right so we we know where to evangelize where to edify and where to have benevolence benevolence for needy saints that's the work of the church. And where does uh, social activities fall into the, those three works? Well, I, I don't see it. Uh, maybe someone could argue, well, it's edification. Well, edification comes back to what was previously said, that it is a, uh, we are to be teaching. Uh, that, is the, that is the focus. If we start putting our emphasis on filling people's bellies or entertaining people, that's what they're going to be coming for. And if you go to John chapter 6 and verse 26, uh, when Jesus is confronting the people, how they have been chasing him, trying to find him. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Now, as an individual, he certainly did feed them. He had that compassion because they were hungry and they were starving uh, and, he, and he fed them. Uh, and that's a lesson for us for as individuals, compassion. We should be eager to help people who are in need. But. He also gives us a principle to a warning here saying, hey, people, when they get their bellies filled, that's what they're going to want to get filled. So what are we more interested in filling? Are we interested in filling the spirit or are we more interested in filling the bellies? And that's how people will get get converted. Now, some people will begin to argue. So well, whatever the individual can do, the church can do, because all we are is just a collection of individuals. Well, that's not the case either, because individually we have responsibilities that the church doesn't have. Uh, you know, for example, uh, we, we just talk about, you know, the home life or we talk about the business life. The church life is, is not the same as as the home domestics or the or the business side of things or the government side of things. Even the church is its own distinct uh, entity in that sense. 
Uh, maybe the best example that I can come up with in regarding the distinction being made between the individual and the church is found in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where the conversation about honoring widows who are truly widows. And he gives uh, those, um, he gives the criteria of how to distinguish a, a widow who's a widow versus a widow who is indeed a widow. And he gives all those uh, different uh, qualifications there. But then towards the end um, or, of that conversation in verse 16, he says, if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened uh, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Verse 16 there is the one of the best examples to see. There is a distinction between what the church is to do versus what the individual is to do. The individual has a responsibility first and foremost to take care of their widows uh, so that the church can be focused on those who are uh, widows indeed, who don't have those uh, those family members that are able to take care of them. And so First Timothy chapter 5, verse 16, I think is the best argument against the whatever the individual can do the the church can do and so going back to the works of the church uh having a good sound foundation on those uh making sure that we're focused on filling the spirit you know for i am not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ for it is the power of god unto salvation uh in contrast to trying to come up with some gimmick and boy the gimmicks are getting crazy out there i saw one little clip of someone dressed up as woody from toy story and and uh it it, it just blows my mind how gimmicky people try to get to try to get people into the doors use the gospel <laughs> let the gospel be the power of god into salvation and and so those are some mm -hmm. of the those are some of the things that uh i come to to get my mind centered on on this particular question. Nick, great observations. And so, gentlemen, maybe you might say in summation is that as far as the church that Jesus established, its work is evangelism, its edification, building up the members, and its limited benevolence, that is benevolence to people who are Christians. And the, the social aspect, the socializing, does not fit into one of those three categories of authority. And so we would have no authority to use funds collected on the first day of the week for that or to build a structure to provide that. We also have a clear verse in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul says that needs to be separated. You come together for worship. As far as physical hunger, you do that somewhere else. And there's no... He, he doesn't give an alternative where we could just have a prayer and then go off in another, um, you know, we're going to go in our fellowship hall, wherever, and do that. Uh, also, Nick makes a great point. The work of the individual and the work of the church are not the same. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17 is another great passage where the individual is dealing with the Christian in sin long before the church or congregation ever gets involved. And 1 Timothy 5, 16 is also, as he noted, a great example for that. The individual can be involved in politics and business and things like that. That is not the work of the church. The, uh, a number of people have also noted that um, this is a way for uh, the church, which is to be the pillar and ground of the truth, to unfortunately lose sight of its mission and all of a sudden become like a social agency instead of using the gospel and the power of godly lives to draw people in there's the there's the temptation to start using some physical things like food and gimmicks and people have said if that's the bait you're using to bring people in that's what you're going to have to keep them with and that's the sort of membership that you're going to get at the end of the day um, great observations gentlemen uh, I think that is the end of today's show. That is our last question. Okay, so just a reminder, every Wednesday, noon Eastern time, it's our live Bible Q&A. And uh, Colton has placed up the, uh, you know, where to, there we go, there we go. There's where to send all your questions. And um, I appreciate these gentlemen, appreciate your questions today. Keep sending those questions in, Bible question. We will seek to answer it. Uh, from God's word. Also, uh, tomorrow night, older women likewise, eight o'clock uh, Eastern time. 
older women teaching younger women. Also, the Daily Answer, Monday through Friday, uh, the podcast drops at 5 a.m. Eastern Time. And I also, and the Tuesday, the Tuesday show during the day, also Bob's Bible Basics, Bob's Bible Basics, Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, uh, our own Bob, our own beloved Bob doing Bob's Bible Basics. And so, uh, and also the Tuesday show at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Why I Believe, as we're going through different uh, different topics. That's kind of what's on the docket. That's what's on the agenda. And it's all done by gentlemen volunteering their time who got a lot of other things going on. And they, they got a congregation they're preaching at and working in, and they got all sorts of irons in the fire, but they're taking out time today um, to kind of all gather together in the virtual world and answer some, some Bible questions. Thank you to the viewers. Some of you I recognize, some of you I know, some of you I've met through as we've traveled across the country. So um, makes my heart warm uh, when I see your name up there, like, yeah, uh, hanging in there. Uh, what would Solomon say? Hey, when all has been heard is fear God, keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, that's today's show. Uh, as I would sign off on the uh, the daily answer, well, we'll see you in the funny papers. Colton, take us away.